Hello and welcome to From Kubernetes to Paz to Er What's Next. My name is Daniel Bryant. I'm the head of DevRel at Ambassador Labs. You can find me on most of the interwebs at, at Daniel Bryant UK. Please do reach out on Twitter, reach out on, on LinkedIn. Love to get involved and have a chat. So I'm going to do a spoiler alert because it's only a 15 minute talk. I'm going to dive straight into my main premise of the talk. I posited, you know, from Kubernetes to platform as a service to Er What's Next. And I think the answer is golden paths, aka paved roads, paved paths, paved platforms. We'll go into more of what that is in just a moment, but I think this is the next evolution, if you like, the next generation of platform as a service. The real questions I think we need to focus on is how much should you build of this platform yourself and how should you assemble the control plane for effective use, particularly by developers? So the core requirements of a platform. So I've been developing professionally software for like oh, 20 plus years now, done various different roles across my career. And I, even from a very early age of working on Java monoliths, I recognized I needed to code, ship and run. And this is the way the mental model I kind of use to think about things now. And this is coming from the Ambassador Labs team. It's, it's not just me working on this, but I always needed to code in my IDE. I always need to ship producing a binary, handing off code to ops, and I always needed to run, particularly if something was going wrong, I needed to observe what was going on, you know, in the runtime, figure out what was going wrong. These are your core app dev platform requirements, the code, ship, and run. The platform should support these things, right? So let's go back to the future a little bit. Let's look at my dev career over the last 20 years, and apologies, bit of a brain dump table, we'll walk through it together now. I want to overlay my cognitive load on this table. So this is the kind of, you know, learning, the mental struggles I was having, adapting and learning all the tech related to where I was in my career at the time. And spoiler alert, here we go, right? This is kind of the mental load, uh, the cognitive load I was experiencing as my career progressed. Started off in the 2000s, working on uh, Java monoliths, right? It was simply a nice IDE, it was an Oracle J developer IDE, I think. I was coding there. Uh, shipping was quite, you know, quite often really just committing code into the version control system. I didn't really see shipping or running, right? I coded. I was quite happy, to be honest. I had some amazing mentors. I was working on some interesting tech. Um, but, you know, things were running in production, but I didn't see too much about that. As I moved through my career, we did more classic service-oriented architecture, classic SOA. I had to think a bit more about the ship then as well, because we were deploying code, not only in you know, app servers, but we were deploying code in things like enterprise service buses, middleware, these kind of things. So my cognitive load was definitely increasing. I went back to using proper PaaS, Platform as a Service, for a while. Uh, initially Cloud Foundry with Java, and then also um, Heroku with Ruby on Rails. And as a developer, happy days, right? I was literally coding in my IDE, didn't think too much about shipping, Heroku push, CF push, uh, and then if stuff went wrong. I was often in the New Relic at the time, New Relic dashboard, I'll shout them out, right? I was looking at the profiling, seeing what's going on, and you know, it was, it was pretty easy as a developer, right? Life was pretty good. Now, as I moved through into being a consultant, I worked for an amazing company called Open Credo in London, a boutique consultancy. You know, naturally, we saw challenging projects, challenging teams, because as a consultant, that's kind of what you do, right? But I noticed myself, my team, the companies I was working with, our cognitive load was going through the roof. Because as full stack developers, we had to think about every part of code, ship, run. Java, Go, JavaScript, ship was, you know, Jenkins, all Spinnaker, all lots of things. And run was very much like standing up infrastructure, Bash, Terraform, Docker, Mesos, Kubernetes. It was just a lot to take on board. And I think platforms haven't quite caught up with this, right? You look at the classic past, 2010, happy days. Where we're at now, we're, we're struggling to get back to that happiness of the classic past. So what did I learn? Three, three key things, right? Treat your platform as a product. You can't have good DevX, good developer experience, without good user experience. And I mean proper user experience, right? And you need to focus on your workflows as a developer, as an org, how you get things done, and tooling interoperability. These are three key, key things. Let's dive into each one of those now. So platform as a product. You know, this notion of treating your platform as a product is not new. Many of the, the fangs, the big companies, the unicorns, right, have been doing this notion of a golden path for a, some, quite some time. I first bumped into it in Net, uh, from Netflix, 2017. I know they've been doing it internally a lot longer, but they talked about a paved road, a paved path. Platform that if developers adopted that paved road, their lives were very, you know, very easy. They were supported, there was nice docs, it was very clear how that platform worked. Being Netflix, 
Netflix, you could obviously do what you want. Netflix have a very strong freedom and responsibility culture, but if you went off the paved road, you were responsible for supporting that. Famously, Spotify talked a lot about their golden paths. So they have a platform, but a series of golden paths on that platform to support classic you know, web service development, classic desktop development, AI, ML development. They have a series of golden paths, kind of best practices to get you up and running and get you in production as fast as possible. I worked on a bunch of platforms in 2015 time. We built some uh, Mesos based platforms at the time, actually. I was um, coding, I was leading teams doing this with Open Credo. I bumped into some folks at KubeCon, shout out to the Go Spot Check folks, Dave Sudia in particular, jumped on a podcast, and so you can find out more about that. He was also building these um, golden paths, these paved roads. And I've recently chatted to Veterans United Home Loans and the Sneak folks. They're all doing the same thing, right? These folks are not, you know, um, oh, I know Sneak's probably a unicorn, right? But Veterans United Home Loans, kind of government style organization, not on the high street, again, you know, kind of a smallish SME, SMB in terms of the e-commerce space. These folks are recognizing the value of the paved path, the golden path. Everything is product led. And I've learned a lot from Nikki Wrightson over the years. Nikki's worked at FT.com, uh, she's worked at Skyscanner. And this tweet, when it came out, it was, it was riffing off Gergely's also awesome tweet, um, talking about the value of platforms. And Nikki said, platforms are amazing, You're deploying your code onto them, but you need to staff them properly and you need to have proper requirements defined. Treat the platform as a product. And if Nikki's onto that, I'm thinking that's interesting too. And we've really seen it codified with the success of team topologies. Shout out to my friends, Matthew Skelton, Manuel Pace. I've learned a bunch from them over the years, and I'm so happy to see the success of this book. It's from the IT Revolution uh, Press stable. So think about Accelerate from Nicole Forsgren. Think about DevOps Handbook from Gene Kim and, and Patrick DeBar and all the folks there. Jess Humble. Team topologies is the latest craze, you know, within that um, stable of, of, of amazing books. And I understand why it codifies how dev teams interact with platform teams. There's a, just a, a plethora of patterns of best practices on how to operate platform teams, how to operate platforms, kind of as a product, right, as well. So you can't have good developer experience without good user experience. And I've got to shout out the Argo project here, right? I've been lucky enough to chat on the podcast uh, with some Argo uh, founders, some of the original founders, and they talk at Intuit, which, you know, Intuit um, acquired um, Argo and so forth. Um, they talk about a lot of their developers use Argo as a UI onto Kubernetes. Sure, they use it to deploy stuff, but they use it to also understand what's going on in the Kubernetes world. Services, deployments, pods, what's broken, what's up. And I found this fascinating because I was like, yeah, I do the same thing, right? I'm often, often teaching Argo. We're in Bass Labs, we do a lot of teaching, a lot of uh, particularly around continuous delivery. And, and I'm constantly at the Argo CLI. And this is more of an ops themed course, but I'm using the Argo CLI to demonstrate rollouts, Argo rollouts. Um, and I'll frequently flick between the UI and the CLI because it's just such a good user experience, right? It helps me teach the concepts. And I was like, this is good UX. These folks have really thought about this. Now, kind of classic books to recommend. I know they're a bit cliched if you're you know, a designer, but these help. I read them a few years ago. My mentors recommended them. They are really good books to get a firm understanding of, of what UX means. At Ambassador Labs, we think a lot about personas of our customers, our community, ranging from platform experts to hipster developers. That's probably you watching, right? And there's also the 99% developer, as Gene Yang calls them. And these are folks that come in and just want to get their job done. They're not, they don't want to be coop cuttle experts. They don't want to be learning lots about Istio, right? They just want to get their job done. And these is the vast majority of our industry. So we need to make sure our platform supports our core user requirements, our core personas. You have to do your research, user research, the books will help you there. And you also, in my experience, have to watch users in their daily tasks. It's great to have data on how, folk, how folks are using things, but you need to have that qualitative understanding, that sort of human understanding too. I've worked on the telepresence tool as an example. So it's a CNCF uh, sandbox project donated by Ambassador Labs a few years ago now. And in the field, I've seen telepresence used in all manner of ways. Some obviously intended, some amazing, and some horrendous ways that people have kind of like modified it, bootstrapped it with something else. And once you put your tools out there, particularly in open source land, people are gonna do things they think are right. So you need to understand what they're doing rather than what you think they're doing. So workflows and interop, this is super important, right? Um, the Netflix have talked a lot about the notion of full cycle developers, kind of full stack developers, but responsible from you know, code, ship and run. Now they created dedicated platform teams to support these full cycle engineers. 
So the full cycle engineers were responsible for delivering business value, but they used the components, the platform components, from these platform teams. And there's a great quote from, like, from, the, uh, from the blog here, that the centralized platform teams act as force multipliers by turning their specialized knowledge within the workflow into reused, reusable building blocks. And you know, I thought this is really interesting. Another very interesting blog post by Gala Navarro talks about how to build a PLAS for lots of engineers. Um, and there's a big focus on this blog post on standardization and autonomy and the balance between them. You want to standardize maybe on databases. You don't want 20 different database styles running you know, in your um, platform. But you don't also want to mandate just one database style. You want a balance there. And in terms of interop, like do you choose something like OpenTelemetry as a standard API on which to base all your metrics? Because that makes swapping out stuff in the back end much easier in the future as your scale, as your requirements changed. Think about your workflow, think about these key interop points, their leverage points for when things might change in the future, how you're gonna adapt your platform uh, for those, uh, those moments. So wrapping up, where are we as a community now, right? There's a clear need in my mind for a platform control plane emerging. We've talked about code, we've talked about ship and run, and a bunch of things of kind of high level concept have popped up around that, right? You need that dev environment, you need continuous deployment, you need observability, Kubernetes runtime. But how do you actually as a developer interact with all these things? There's many things now, right? How do I interact with these things? I've got to go to a classic you know, Kelsey Hightower tweet because Kelsey's always on point, right? And any, any Kubernetes talk, you have to mention Kelsey. It's in, the, it's in the contract. But this is a fantastic tweet. I'm convinced the majority of people managing infrastructure just want a PaaS. The only requirement, it has to be built by them. Now, when this tweet came out, I was kind of doing this, right? And I, I saw Kelsey kind of pointing us out and I was like, yeah, it's a good point, Kelsey. We're, you know, could we rely on more classic passes rather than building our own thing? But we always had unique workflows, always had unique um, uh, interrupt requirements, or we convinced ourselves we did anyway. Interestingly, Kelsey followed this up a couple of years ago. because That was a um, 2017 tweet. 2019, he said, the delta between Kubernetes and a developer-friendly PaaS is where the next layer of value is. And he talked about workflows too. And when I saw this, I was like, ah, yes, Kelsey, this is the golden path we're talking about, right? We, you know, it's a, some notion of a standardized platform as a service, but with unique workflows unique interop for your teams. So it's, it's this kind of thing, golden path has been emerging for a while within the industry. Uh, my, one of my most popular tweets, I just put it out and, and it was fantastic to see the results coming back, talked about platform engineering. Now this, you know, we're at Platform Engineering Con, right? Platform Con, like this is the machine, the engine behind these golden paths, these platforms, right? Platform engineering is somewhat of a new skill set, but we're together discovering what you need to think about. And I've been super lucky to chat to amazing people. I'm just gonna name check three folks there. Alan Barr, Bo Daly from Zipcar, Crystal Hershorn from Sneak. Um, I've learned a lot about what we need to think about when building these platforms. And I wanted to quickly dive in now. This is gonna be a bit of a brain dump slide. I apologize in advance. I'll whip through it. You can look at the slides later. There's some key insights I've learned from these folks on the podcast. Successful orgs are definitely investing in these golden paths and staffing them across accordingly, treating them as products. They're starting small and then they're getting big. They're developer-led motions. They're not top-down mandates. They're not systems bought on the golf course and mandated on the teams. They're developer-led bottom-up motions. The leadership though is communicating the long-term vision and the business goals of where your platform's getting to. There's clear value to be had by creating an effective platform. People are recognizing the socio-technical factors, adopting this hospitality focus, thinking, empathizing with developers who are gonna be using this platform day in, day out. A good UI paints a thousand CLIs. We saw that with Argo, right? But don't forget your user base. Sometimes the CLI is super important too. You've gotta to focus on eliminating toil. Automate and create to remove friction. This is the key thing, right? And adopt standards, particularly around workflow and interop, APIs, best practices like GitOps, adopting the Kubernetes resource model using CRDs will save you a lot of time when you need to change things in the future. So the need for a developer control plane, right? Let's wrap this up. There is this thing we need at the top, this developer control plane, this, this platform you know, interface. And we think the CNCF ecosystem is the foundation for this modern developer control plane. You need a custom UI on top. We have this at Ambassador Labs with our service catalog. Many other service catalogs are emerging as well. And there's machinery like webhooks, CRDs, APIs below, and then all the tools supporting. And these, you know, if you choose your um, interop correctly, you can swap some of these tools out. But you need to think about the platform as a product. 
So wrapping up, from Kubernetes to PaaS to golden paths, the key questions you need to ask yourself is how much do you want to build of this platform yourself? And how do you assemble an effective control plane for daily use by your developers? Treat the platform as a product, realize about the importance of developer experience and user experience, and focus on your workflows and tooling interop. Think about that developer control plane. Thanks so much. You can reach out to me here at dv at datawire.io, at Daniel Bryant UK on most of the interwebs. Join us for the Golden Path Pizza Party. We'll reach out to your team and help you adapt Golden Paths, adopt Golden Paths. And we've also got a bunch of useful material online. Thanks for your time.